Okay, great. Well, thanks everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining our webinar on corridors with CTC tools. I uh, just wanted to confirm, Colin, can you hear me well? How's uh, the audio? Everything working out? Yeah, you sound great. Perfect. Thank you. Well, thanks again for joining everyone. My name is Ramil Laksma, and I'm one of SolidCAD's account manager for the infrastructure GIS team. Joining me again is my colleague, Colin Gade, one of our many techs with SolidCAD. Our agenda for today is an intro of who is SolidCAD for those that are new, followed by an intro to CTC software. Then I'll be handing off the webinar to Colin for an overview and live demo on CTC's corridor tool. We'll finalize the session with a Q&A session, so please go ahead and type in your questions. But before we get started, just a FYI, next Wednesday, December 16th, um, directly hosted by CTC, is a webinar on new features to Corridor Mapper. Uh, this will illustrate how to create dynamic target mapping, alleviating time spent on doing this, and eliminating costly errors as well. And we're also continue doing our online session. Um, we found that the online instructor-based training very fruitful and engaging with respect to student and teacher interaction. It's uh, aided all participants to follow the material at hand and from one student while the others witness solutions all together. It's proven to be a great learning atmosphere. So reach out to your sales rep for details and reserve your spots or go ahead and visit uh, solidcad.ca for more events. So who is SolidCAD? Well, we're your Autodesk reseller that's kept the Platinum uh, partner status the highest for well over 25 years. We specialize in technology that helps support clients in the industries in architecture, engineering, construction, civil infrastructure, and manufacturing. And through our services, we've helped uh, clients maximize their ROI for their technological investments, whether it's workflow uh, assessment, technical support or consulta consultation and training. Uh, we have a dedicated combined team of 11 specialists and growing actually located coast to coast, ready to assist you in various time zones with training facilities also located right across the, right across the nation. So SolarCAD incorporated CTC as part of their product line because we wanted to be partnered with the industry leaders in productivity tools. Since 2010, CTC has developed add-ins for Revit and Civil 3D and established membership in the Autodesk Developer Network. They're, the, they're leading the pace in developing BIM technologies and software services. As of 2019, these tools, the Express tools, are being used more than 64,000 users worldwide and in more than 75% of top firms in the U.S. alone. So with that, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Colin, for a demo on corridors with CTC tools. Colin? Right on. Thanks a lot, Ramil. Got a big group today. Awesome. Uh, can you see my screen all right there? Perfect. Excellent. So this is a little bit of a refined agenda of uh, what we're going to go through here. Again, you've seen this already. Creation techniques, surfaces. We'll get into those CTC tools, performance, and uh, a real-world scenario. Um, this real-world scenario is going to be how to use uh, retaining walls uh, and how to create a retaining wall using corridors and feature lines, and we'll, we'll get into all of that. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about are baselines. Um, corridors have been able to be, been able to use uh, feature lines as their baselines for a couple years now. Um, I still don't find many people using them as baselines though. So I'm going to flip it over to Civil 3D and we'll, we'll take a look here. Um, typically, if we've got a road, we need an alignment because we need stationing, but we also want that design restrained criteria uh, or that design design criteria that you're able to get with your alignments and profiles. Now, if I zoom in here though, sometimes we've got kind of a, 
a split here and we've got a ditch that needs to deviate from that alignment. Well, sometimes it's easier to just simply have a feature line represent that. And then we can apply a corridor to it as well. We've got this kind of in our arsenal of tools, so we don't want to forget about the fact that we can that we can use this for corridors. Um, and in fact, Civil 3D has gotten a lot better at being able to integrate different pieces of their tools uh, together. So if I had a berm, for example, and it was represented by this alignment, well, I still want to use my grading tools for this for this berm but you can't use a baseline for grading tools. That can't, be a, that can't be an alignment. What we've got now as well, is we can create a feature line from an alignment and have that feature line remain dynamic to the alignment. So call it what we want. We don't need it on the ditch site. Give it a name if we need to. Top of berm but we can use that alignment, the profile for the elevations, and we can use right here. We've got this create dynamic link to the alignment. So we'll see what that does with it checked. And I click okay. I don't need to weed that, but now I can select it and I've got an auto feature line. If I select that feature line, it, it doesn't look like one because there aren't any grips. Um, but that feature line is completely dynamic to not only the alignment, but also the profile. So if I were to zoom down here, if I'm building a berm, it's a lot easier to see what's going on with that berm if I've got it in a nice profile view right here, especially for the elevations. I can set that at 10%, 0%, and then I can have that 25% right there. And then if I need to, I can click and drag this down maybe a little bit. And all of those, all of those changes are then going to be reflected into the feature line. Now, if we didn't want that feature line connected, right click's kind of our best friend with a lot of this stuff. You get to see a lot of uh, options that you may not have known existed. So I can right click and you see I've got this remove dynamic link. So I can select that. And now I've just got a regular feature line. So it's definitely, again, another tool in your arsenal to, uh, to kind of keep in your back pocket when you may need to use it. Um, it gives you a lot more control, but having that feature line there allows you to use your grading tools as well. Not totally corridors, but something worth uh, worth uh, checking out. The next thing we're going to look at is when we use corridors for something like a pond design or something like that, we can have the corridor for the initial design and then we can compound on top of that using, if you see the little diamonds right there, we can use grading tools on top of that through extracted contours. Um, the main thing that we have to be worried about here is where we're starting our alignment with a closed loop. Because as we can see here, if I flip to Civil 3D, if you're not careful on these corners, you're going to end up with something called a bow tie. And those bow ties, it's going to have feature lines cross each other and it won't be very aesthetic and it's even more frustrating for design. Now, those for the most part these days will actually clean themselves up. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But sometimes, if I look at this pond here, that's uh, a little bit earlier in the design process, well, I've got clean corner, clean corner, clean corner. But down at the bottom here, this is where my alignment starts and stops. Now, I, that's this weird junky bow tie where it's just trying to make a perpendicular alignment or sorry, uh, assembly added at the start and at the end. But as a result, we've got feature lines crossing and it's, it's a bit of a mess. We can't fix this one. Um, 
And we can't fix it because the alignment starts and stops right on that corner. So the key here is to remember if you need a closed loop for a corridor, start it on a straightaway. So you've got zero, 20, 40, right? It also ends on that same spot. And because it ends on a straightaway, the frequency or that, that assembly that's put in there at the start and at the end coincide nicely. So things to keep in mind when you've got a closed loop corridor. I'm gonna flip back to the PowerPoint there. The next thing we're going to talk about is or are assemblies. Oh. Let's go back one there. Assemblies and working with assemblies a little bit. And by the way, I'm gonna stop about halfway through as well for questions. So please do uh, take your questions in if you have any and we'll address them about halfway through and then again at the end as well. Um, so let's jump back into Civil 3D and we'll take a look at some of these, these issues with offsets, link and mark point and copy paste and mirror or copy move and mirror rather. Now, this is a typical assembly, as I'm sure that you guys are well aware of. And if we come in here, this is the actual assembly. And each of these components are sub-assemblies. So I've got one, two, three sub-assemblies on the right and three sub-assemblies on the left. If I grab the assembly marker and jump into the assembly properties, we can take a look at the construction tab right here. So we can see how the left side's made and how the right side's made. Well, that coincides nicely, right? One, two, three, one, two, three. That fits nicely. Now, if I pan over to this one here, and I'm obviously kind of alluding to something, it looks the exact same, but let's go in and take a look at these properties here. There's nothing on the right side. Well, there's only a lane on the right side. So why is there only a lane on the right side? Let's let's kind of investigate here a little bit. We'll cancel out and take a look. Now, remember I said right click's kind of always your friend here? If I take a look at this curve and I right click, well, I don't have access to this move, copy, mirror, and I've got add to assembly. Well, why do I have to add this to an assembly? It's already, it looks like it's there. Someone's just taken it and dropped it there. There's a lot of metadata that happens behind the scenes uh, with assemblies and corridors and things like that. And they need to be, you need to use the right tools with them. You can't just drop this here and expect it to work. It, it might work a small portion of the time, but most of the time you're gonna end up with an assembly that's broken and it doesn't work. So I can click add to assembly and fix this. So select marker point within an assembly. When it's talking about marker points, it's talking about these circles right here. So it's a marker style for the points. Sub assembly, nope. Sub assembly, yes, right here. And now to check that, there's a couple ways to do it, but I can right click and notice that add to assembly is grayed out now, it's connected. We may have to do the same thing here and we can check that with, again, a right click. Well, yeah, add to the assembly, zoom in and we'll click. We'll pick, not this one, I think it should be that one. Let's see if we were right. Yeah, awesome. Now we can check this again to be absolutely certain in the assembly properties. Assembly properties, construction tab, one, two, three on the left, one, two, three on the right. That, that works flawlessly. When we're using sub-assemblies, we have to use either in the contextual tab or through the right click, the copy, move or mirror. These are special sub-assembly copy move mirrors commands that are going to help keep it connected to the assembly and have everything 
still work from the, the metadata behind the scenes in that. It works slightly differently, especially with the mirror command. So the mirror command is always going to mirror about the Y axis. So it's always going to mirror about the Y axis. And no matter what, for this one here, for example, if I mirror about this point, it's going to mirror right on the other side of this point from here over, even if I pick this guy. So it doesn't matter the distance from the mirror point that you pick, it's still gonna mirror it that way. So if I take this guy, right click, mirror. Now I'll probably get a little problem here. Yeah, are you sure you want to mirror to the same side of the assembly? Yeah, all right. For now, yes. And it's going to mirror it right there, but still keep it connected to the assembly. Now, the nice thing, AutoCAD delete or the delete command on your keyboard, we're good to go. Let's take a look at another scenario here. And for that, I'm going to pan down to a corridor that's using a slightly different uh, assembly here. And I'm going to look at it in Corridor Section Editor. Now, right now, if I take this corridor, I can actually go to the Modify Regions and go to the Region Properties here. I'd like this one. And I can change the assembly it's using. So I'll, I'll go use that uh, broken assembly that we just fixed. Okay. It's going to rebuild and you can see that it worked there. Now, there's a couple things going on here. Let's clear the log. What if I did the same thing though and I put it back to that sound wall right here, that sound wall assembly. Click OK. And now it's, it's just given me this line. There's no wall of any kind there. So what's going on? Well, it's got no marked point found. Well, let's go look at this in the, the actual assembly itself. We'll troubleshoot here. Take the assembly, assembly properties, construction tab. I see right away at the bottom of the list, there is a marked point. The issue with this is when a corridor processes the whole corridor, it has to process things in a certain order. So it's got, it's going down the, the alignment and then it's going to process the assembly. And it starts from the top of the list here and works down. So it's gonna process the whole left side first, then it takes the right side and processes it and gets to this guy. Link to slope between points. This is looking for that marked point. It needs to connect to that marked point the issue is we have to process that marked point first, meaning that we need that marked point above that link between points. So we should be able to select this, right click and move up. Now, as I was processing or as I was getting ready for this webinar, I realized right now I'm showing you an external monitor. So this is a, a monitor connected via HDMI. I can't use that right click command. And it's kind of a pain in the butt. Now, what I'm going to do is stop sharing and share my screen one here. Now, you'll see a couple notes. I'm not too worried about that. But if we move this over, now I can right click on my main screen, my laptop screen. I can rename it, delete it, or I could move up. That's the attempt we were looking for. There's some weird stuff that happens with Civil 3D. So I'll stop sharing and I'll, I'll put that back. And put that back right there. There we go. I just want to make sure, I think I exited that accidentally. There we go, and we're back. <laughs> so we've moved that above now, 
we can click OK. And because I've edited the assembly here, all I have to redo is rebuild that corridor. Rebuild. And you can see now that it's got the right order for processing. It's found that link to mark point. It's adjusted everything. And the way this assembly actually works is we're finding a minimum top value for that, uh, for that berm. So uh, whatever it is, uh, two meters for the top of the berm or four meters for the top of the berm. And then it's gonna slope down either side. So it's a handy little piece. I'll close out of this. And now I'm just gonna close out of a couple of these drawings here. Uh, I shall keep this one. So the next thing we're going to talk about are a couple of the anomalies that happen within corridor. Open a couple more drawings here. There we go. As that's opening things up, I'm going to flip back to the PowerPoint here. Um, and some of those anomalies that happen with corridors here, like we talked about already, bow ties. But there's this other thing, and, and people have kind of named this a waterfall. And what that is, is for some reason, the corridor is trying to target to zero. And it's trying to figure out, we're trying to figure out why that corridor, all of a sudden the, the center line elevation drops to zero, and now it's trying to target that existing surface again. So let's flip back into Civil 3D, and I hope that these drawings are open. Almost there. <clears throat> and we're gonna take a look at these bow ties and waterfalls, and maybe some settings that you weren't aware of. Asking Civil 3D to do a lot, opening and closing drawings. <laughs> there. So this corridor, you can see that it's it's not nearly as bad as the one on my PowerPoint, but there is definitely a bow tie there. Now, the way we deal with those bow ties is if we select it, they've introduced a simple little tool as clear corridor bow ties. I can click that, and then it's going to ask me. Specify starting sub entity. So the baseline for that corridor, what's the baseline right before that corridor bow tie? And what's the baseline right afterwards? Select that, and then it's going to ask where those bow ties, where that bow tie should tie into. Now, it's hard to kind of explain, but you want to kind of extrude this out to where it should have connected, and we can pick right about there. Now that's pretty good. When I click enter, it's gonna triangulate that nicely for me. Now, I could try and do the same over here. This one's a little bit different. It's just, there wasn't a frequency close enough here, so it's pinching. That's still considered a bow tie, and we can still use that clear bow tie command. So I'll pick the starting entity, the ending entity, and where it should have gone, which is maybe, now, what if I picked way the heck out here? And that's where you have to be careful. It's going to try and triangulate all of them to out there. So now you've got the opposite issue. So we want to be a little bit careful with how this all ties in together. Now, I've got almost the exact same corridor. The only difference is it was connected, or it was created while connected to, well, while new settings were added in there. Now, these settings allow us to automatically correct these bow ties. And if I go down here in my settings tab, under corridor feature settings, it's where we can find this automatic corner cleanup options. Open that up and we can clear inside and outside corners for tangent to tangent intersections, or tangent arc to tangent arc intersections. 
we can set these to yes and they'll do a pretty good job for us as you can see right here it's kind of cleaned it all up nicely there now this this is just part of the alignment it's a tangency violation uh, but we knew that that only works that automatic corridor bow tie cleanup only works if there are no width and offset targets or no surface targets in that alignment because the width doesn't change so it knows what the width should be so it knows exactly where to tie in right there to make this the, the same width the whole way along. Now, the other scenario there that we were talking about, let's take a look at waterfalls. And this waterfall, it's, it's tying into zero for some reason. It's dropping that corridor right to zero. Now, doing some investigative work and thinking about how a corridor is made, what can affect it? Well, in this case, we've got an alignment, we've got an assembly, and we've got a profile. Well, if I take a look right here and I move this back, it's clearly not the assembly. The assembly seems to be working, and I actually just fixed that right there. But I need this to go all the way to zero. So what's different at zero? It's gotta be my profile. So let's take a look up at this profile right here and zoom in. Well, I'm starting to see the error. The design profile didn't go all the way to zero plus zero zero. It went to zero plus zero two zero. So if I take this and maybe this was just done really quickly, but if I put that right at zero, it's gonna rebuild that corridor for me, or it should. There, not quite. Rebuild, and it fixes it. Now I'll run into that same scenario down at the end, and it's because that design profile, maybe we wanted it to tie in right here, but we need to continue that design profile. So we need to add some more vertices if that were the case. Otherwise, I can snap it right there, pan out, rebuild my sound wall, and fix that waterfall. So if you've ever run into those weird issues right there where your, your corridor just drops off, definitely check your profile. Um, now, the next thing I want to talk about here are corridor surfaces. And corridor surfaces are usually created by adding links. So perpendicular pieces on the tops or bottoms of the assemblies, and that's gonna connect in and out of the page to create a surface kind of thing, if you're looking at that cross section right here. The issue comes in right here, where it's not respecting that gutter line and it's it's allowing the surface to triangulate straight through that gutter line right there sometimes we need to add the we need to add the feature lines as well so if i pop back over here into civil 3d and we'll just take a look at this one we were already looking at quarter surface now we talked about the fact that our corridors, we can create a surface, we can add links or feature lines to them. And those feature lines come from the points in the sub-assemblies getting stretched and connected point to point to point creates the feature lines. So I can add my top links or bottom links. So all of the bottom links on the assembly are called the datum links. I can add those in there. And then if I needed to, I could add feature lines. And I have a list of all of the point codes in my assembly to add in there if I needed to. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk about is this guy right here, your overhang correction. 
always set that bottom overhang correction when you're looking for your base of excavation surface right here or your datum surface. We need that bottom overhang correction. And I'll try and explain why here. If I scale back in and just take a look at one of these guys right here, we'll just take a look at the left side because it's the same from right to left. Now, what are our datum links? Our datum links connect across the very bottom most pieces of each of our sub-assemblies. So we've got them along each one of these. Now, the issue is when it's processing that surface, it's going to look to connect the dots. So the start of that link, the end of that link, the start of that link, and then what's the next one to the left? Well, it's not this one anymore. It's, it's this datum link where we need to start. So that's where it's gonna try and ping up and then back down and then continue straight on. That's the scenario you're gonna get if you don't use those bottom overhang corrections. And it's gonna look, well, exactly like this. So we wanna avoid those scenarios and the overhang correction does that. It used to be a ton more complicated. <laughs> the next thing I wanna talk about here are the those boundaries for the surface. Oh. And I've just got this as kind of a placeholder. We'll get right back into Civil 3D. It's much easier to check this out right on right in the software. Corridor surface. Now, when we're creating a boundary for our surface, if we have a road that continues on like this. Well, this is an inside corner for a surface and it's gonna try and triangulate inside that. That is what we don't want. That might be a lot or, or lot grading or something like that. So we wanna avoid that and we can do that through adding a boundary to the surface. In the boundaries tab, right click and we get some options for boundaries. Most of the time, Corridor extents as outer boundaries is good enough. And when we click that, the definition for it is corridor shrink wrap. So it grabs the, the outermost of the corridor and pulls all of that and uses it as the boundary. That may not always be what we want though. So we have options. We could select it from a polygon that we've already drawn. We could add a boundary interactively. And if we click that, it brings us into the drawing and we can pick and click all the way. We've also got add automatically. Now this one's kind of cool because it's using the feature lines in our corridor to do that. What we have to be careful with there is it's only gonna give us options for those feature lines if there's two of them. So I've got two edge of travel ways. So I've got that. But what if I've only got sidewalk on one side? Well, now I've only got one sidewalk out and one sidewalk in. So I don't have that in this list. So it's useful if we only wanted the surf, if we only wanted the surface to go just to kind of back of curb, for example. That's good, but we need to have only two of those feature lines in the corridor. So I'll jump back in here. Um, Ramil, do we have any questions at this point? No, there's no questions uh, yet, but folks, please go ahead and type in your questions. Any comments, please uh, go ahead and type them in. We'll definitely address them as they come in. All right, no worries, thanks a lot. So the next thing we're gonna talk about here is some of the corridor manipulation that we've got with these CTC tools. So we've got three of them here and then we'll talk about the fourth one a little bit separately. These three are for kind of corridor manipulation as a whole. Um, 
we can merge and split corridors. And then we've got a really cool one there with corridor cleanup, which allows us to actually kind of nuke all of the, all or some of the targeting. So what we've got in this drawing is just one giant corridor. Now we, we may have reached the end of the season and realized that, geez, we did not get to any of this part in the middle. We need to separate this out into two corridors so that we can have a phase two as well. Well, corridor splitter does that really easily here. I can click corridor splitter. I can grab that whole corridor and it's gonna give me a list of everything that's in that corridor, baselines and regions. And then I can just go along and say, I need this one to be in the second one. I need this region. So it'll split things up based on baselines or regions themselves. So I'll quickly go through here, select a couple of these. And looks good. When we click OK, it's going to tell me what we've got here. And it's going to split all of those regions for me into two quarters. So I clearly grabbed one of the wrong quarter there. Not a big deal. Because the other tool that we've got there is corridor merger as well. And if I want to merge corridors back together, I can simply grab it, select corridor one, select corridor two, and click enter. It gives me the options. Well, what do I want to name my corridor? Line development. There we go. We can pick our code set style if we need to. We can merge identical baselines. And we can pick both of the corridors to be merged. There we go. We can also pick which surface to use because it actually split up both of the surfaces that were in there as well. Click finish, and then we've just got one quarter left again. So this can be really handy in certain scenarios <clears throat> because now we just have one quarter here. Now the last piece of that is actually a free tool and it's called Corridor Cleanup. If we select this one, pick the corridor, and select enter, it gives us all of, again, the baselines and regions, and it allows us to delete any or all of the targeting within there. Sometimes our corridors can get real messy, and we'd rather just start from scratch kind of thing. So this gives you a clean slate very, very quickly. Click OK, it runs through, and it deletes all of that stuff. Deleting all of the targeting in there. Now, if I jump back to the PowerPoint here, and jump to the next slide, we're going to look at that last tool here, and this one is very powerful for target mapping. Now, it gives you everything in one nice box. Now, this is getting updated a little bit uh, in the coming weeks, but the principles are still very much the same. If I take a look here, I've got kind of a road here, and what's going on with it is I've got kind of driveways represented by these, these lines right here, these simple polylines. I've got flyby lanes represented by offset alignments and, and widenings. And I'd like to start targeting all of that. Well, how do I do that natively? I'd have to come in here and edit targets. Well, there's only one region here, so I can pick that. Oh God. How do you decipher what's what in here? You can't even decipher which one's left and which one's right, apart from luckily we've named them. 
So I know this is driveway left. Now I can select that. And now I've got feature lines and align or feature lines, survey figures and polylines or alignments. Well, I know I've got polylines. Now I could pick them from drawings, pick them from a drawing rather. That would be tedious and I may miss a couple. Or I could select them by layer. Well, that's cool. Let's grab them by layer, but holy crap, there's a ton of layers in here. So it gets fairly tedious. I've got, luckily I've named that layer correctly. So I can check that box, okay? And it adds them all in there for me. But now I, I wanna see what it did. So I have to, okay, and okay again, and it's gonna rebuild that corridor. And okay, that worked, but I've still got this sidewalk in here. What's going on? So I have to come back. And you can see how this gets tedious, jumping in and out of three different dialog boxes just to get things working properly. And now that looks a little bit better, that sidewalk's gone. And what's even more frustrating is that I can't select those alignments by layer. And if I were to drag this out, rebuild this corridor and just copy a couple of these ones that were on a layer. Well, now I have to go back and do everything the same way. I can't just rebuild my corridor. Rebuild and, and nothing happens. We have to go back, delete that layer, re-add that layer, and then it's gonna start targeting those again. Corridor Mapper seriously improves this efficiency here. If we pop that open, it gives us a one-stop shop for kind of all of that targeting. Separating out by corridor or by baseline if we wanted to. It gives us the option to go and pick that lane. Okay, I'll go pick the lane layer. And it does everything through matching layers. Now that one's good. Now I could go down and pick driveway left, but the other thing here is I can just, once I've got assemblies and layers matched up properly, I can just auto map layers and it's gonna add those all in for me. Well, that looks great. Oh, frig, but my, my one assembly here was missing or my one sub assembly was missing the right name. Well, it would be a pain in the butt to go and rename that subassembly again and everything like that. So what we can do with Corridor Mapper here, pick that layer, and I want to rename that subassembly. I'll just check that box right there. When I click OK, it's going to rename that subassembly, and it's going to add all of those targets and give me a little summary right here. Yeah, that's awesome. So I find it's a lot more streamlined of a workflow working through this and having it apply all of my targets for me. The last good thing is if I pull this off over here and I have a number of more driveways and things like that that I need to add in. Just uh, pick a couple of these and copy them across. Couple more here. Well, natively, we'd have to go back, delete that layer, re-add that layer to get everything working. With Corridor Mapper, it already knows the layer it's looking for. So it just goes auto map layers or auto map targets right there. Pick, it's gonna do that process for me. It's already knows which ones it's looking for. And now it's got 64. Click yes. And it sets all that stuff up for us. So a couple more things here that I'm going to talk us through. If we flip back to the PowerPoint and jump to the next slide, we're going to take a look at performance here, moving away from those CTC tools now. And we're going to talk about uh, 3D viewing of corridors. 
Now, if you've ever tried to orbit around a corridor or open it up in object viewer and things like that, you may, you're, you're looking at a whole bunch of frequencies that probably look similar to this. And that's because of your code set style. And if we take a look at what that code set style is looking at here, for every 3D view in our object viewer or something like that, it's got points for each one of these things. It's got links for each one of these things. And then it's also got all of the shapes right in here. Now, if you add all of that up, that's probably over a hundred different things that it needs to process in Object Viewer. And that's just for one single instance in the corridor. So it's that corridor is trying to compute like tens of thousands to maybe hundreds of thousands worth of points and objects and things like that. So it takes a long time. We can speed that up if we have a different code set style that only shows maybe the top of the surface, right? Or the top of the corridor like this, because that's probably what we're looking for. And if we're not, maybe we need to make a slightly different code set style. But now it's got one, two, three, four, and a couple links, and it can, it only has a very, like a fraction of what it has had to process before. So it's a lot faster. Now I'm gonna flip to Civil 3D to take a look at the performance here. Now we're gonna run into scenarios where we've got kind of a, a very large corridor and you get a long, long straightaways that you really don't need heavy frequency settings and things like that. But then you'll run into different areas that maybe represent whatever the case, uh, a bridge or something like that, where you need a lot more frequencies in here. How do we set that up without putting those frequencies across the entire corridor? Because that would make a very daunting corridor. What we can do, if I zoom back in here, is we can split this corridor up into regions. And, and isolate the areas that we need a lot tighter of frequencies in. And I say isolate, I actually quite literally mean isolate. We have a tool and I, I know a lot of people don't know about it. Under the modify regions drop down right here, we've got isolate regions. And I can just pick this region right here and now look at the speed of my drawing. <laughs> Should have warned you guys, but uh, that's a heck of a lot faster. Now I can grab that corridor and I can adjust the frequencies for just that region right there. Set it to one. Now this area is super tight, but nothing else is. So I get the detail I'm looking for without compromising performance. Um, the last thing I wanna talk about there before getting into a retaining wall example is kind of multiple drawings here. You reach limits with Civil 3D. And if you've got a hundred kilometers worth of road, yeah, the alignment and profile will be fine, should be fine to span that entire 100 kilometers worth of road. But when you're getting into corridors and things like that, that is a lot heavier of an object in Civil 3D that it's gonna have to process and things like that. So sometimes maybe you just keep the alignment the whole length of the road. And then in separate drawings, we separate out every 10 kilometers or something like that of corridor. That's gonna keep each of those drawings a lot smaller and moving a lot faster. So for the last of this here, I wanted to combine some of the tools that we talked about in the past there, uh, in earlier on in the presentation. And I wanna look at a scenario right here to create a retaining wall. Now, I've just kept a 3D view here so we can see what's going on. What we've got is this retaining wall assembly. And what I'm showing here is there's, 
a decent amount of relief across the site over here. And it, it's not going to cut it to just slope down to existing. We're going to need a retaining wall along this green portion. We can get some really cool control out of this when we're looking at having feature lines as baselines and, and grabbing this as a corridor. Not only the control, but the, um, the editability, being able to go through iterations of this very, very quickly. So what I can do right here with this corridor or with this uh, feature line is jump into Elevation Editor. There we go. And it's pretty cool what we can do here. This is new as of 2018, I believe. A feature line can not only just have elevations, we can actually make it relative to a surface. So instead of having editable elevations, we can keep it relative to a surface and keep it always stay maybe four feet above that surface. And you can see how it just raises it there. If I were to move this surface up and down, that's also gonna follow. Now, <clears throat> after that, once we've got our feature line kind of set up there, then we wanna make a corridor from it. You can create a corridor, and it's going to give me There we go. I don't want an alignment and profile. So I'll, I'll pick a feature line here. And in fact, I can pick that feature line from the drawing very easily. Pick it right there. I have to name it to use it, which is fine. And we should always be naming these feature lines in here. So we click OK and we've got that baseline for it. Then we just have to apply an assembly. And we probably also need a target surface here. I'll uncheck that just so we get everything working. And just like that, we should have a corridor here. Rebuild. There we go. Now this is pretty cool because it's targeting the surface, the existing surface, so we can see that it's flowing there, kind of it's adapting to the surface as it comes down to the corner. And we can get a lot better of a result here if we edit the frequencies of that, of that uh, corridor. So maybe we make it every five feet. And you can see how this really gets dense right here. And it's completely following everything. Now, setting things up this way is really handy because if our parking lot grades change, say I need to grab that surface and realize that I need to raise the whole surface. Well, I could just raise the whole surface by five feet, for example, if I needed to. And that retaining wall is still gonna fall in place. All I have to do is rebuild that. And it's always going to target that surface. And it's always going to maintain the baseline that's going to stay four feet above that surface right there. So there's some really cool stuff that we can do with corridors that's not necessarily just roads. We can use them to really speed up some of our design. Um, so with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'll toss it back to you, Ramel. Are there any questions so far? Oh, Ramel, oh, there you go. Sorry, yeah, so there's no questions, but please, Folks, go ahead and type them in. And um, 
Okay. Just want to remind everyone about the upcoming event for next week is the CTC webinar series, Civil 3D Corridor Mapper, new features. That's at, uh, next Wednesday, starts at 1 p.m. And if any of your colleagues would want to see this on a, uh, who missed it, we can definitely do a demo for the rest of the CAD team. And if there's a trial version, um, we can't provide that as well. It's a 14 day, but we can extend that to a 30 day. Um, there's been some requests for during this holidays uh, for clients to play around with. So we can definitely get that for you as well. So I don't see any questions coming in. Um, with that, um, I'd like to thank everyone. Uh, thanks for joining and hope to see you next time. And please do keep in touch and continue to go into our website for our latest events, okay? And with that, I'll give back three minutes of your time. Enjoy the rest of your day, folks. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day.